everyone is aware of what temperature is in a day-to-day -day context, but what does temperature actually mean in fundamental terms? Temperature is a measure of the internal energy of a system, and for a gas or liquid, it translates to the measure of how fast the atoms are moving about. For scientists who want to study the fundamental properties of atoms, it is generally in their interest to cool the atoms as much as possible, since it is typically more difficult to observe objects moving at high speeds. At room temperature, atoms in a gas or liquid can be moving at speeds of around 300 meters per second, which is about the speed of a Boeing 747, so techniques are required to cool atoms down. Considering particles only stop moving at zero Kelvin, you'll need more than just an ice bath to significantly reduce the speed of atoms. So what do scientists use to get atoms very cold? The answer is lasers. If you're familiar with popular culture, you might find this confusing, as lasers are normally associated with heat. But lasers can also be used to cool things down. So, let's explain. In the early 20th century, figures such as Albert Einstein and Max Planck pushed the idea that light exists as quantized packets of energy. In this particle model, photons also carry momentum in spite of having no mass. As such, collisions between photons and real particles transfer some of that momentum, as does the absorption of said photons. As we can see from the Planck-Einstein relation on the screen now, the energy of a photon is directly proportional to its frequency. Between atomic orbitals, there are energy gaps that can be jumped by electrons upon interaction with a photon whose energy is close in value to the size of that energy gap. The photon frequency for which this occurs is commonly known as the resonance frequency. Additionally, the conservation of momentum requires the atom to recoil to compensate for the loss of momentum from the absorbed photon. The imparted recoil velocity is in the direction of the instant light and usually only changes the speed of the atom by a few centi or millimetres a second, which is a pretty negligible change in the context of the thermal velocities of around 300 metres per second. After a short time, the atom returns to its ground state and the energy difference between the ground state and the previously occupied excited state is ejected as a photon in a random direction. This gives the atom a fluorescence. This process of absorption and emission is known as a fluorescence cycle. The emitted photon imparts a recoil velocity again on the atom, but this time in a random direction, the net result being acceleration of the atom in the direction of the beam. Although experimental demonstrations of this phenomenon go back to 1933, it wasn't until the invention of narrowband tunable lasers in the 1970s that using light to cool atoms could be done to very low temperatures. These lasers were able to provide intense, near monochromatic and frequency adjustable sources of light, allowing significant strength and control to the pressure this light could exert on atoms. One of the first proposed experimental setups made to cool a gas of atoms was done by Theodore Hansch and Arthur Schaulow in 1975. Their proposed experimental setup has three orthogonal pairs of laser beams incident on a confined gas of atoms. The laser beams are tuned to just below the resonance frequency of the atoms contained. This is because this method is making use of the Doppler effect to ensure only some atoms experience radiation pressure. As a result of the Doppler effect, when the atoms are moving towards an incident laser beam, from their frame of reference, the frequency is perceived to be slightly greater than what an observer would see. Therefore, only atoms moving in the direction of a laser beam will experience it as the resonance frequency, go through a fluorescence cycle and have their velocity impacted by the laser. This will average out to decrease the velocity of all atoms in the system and therefore cool the gas. In this state, the cold atoms will behave more viscously in a medium known as optical molasses. However, Due to the discrete nature of these radiation pressure interactions, a very slight heating effect does occur during the momentum exchange, which ultimately means there is a minimum temperature that can be reached by this method, unsurprisingly called the Doppler cooling limit. The Doppler cooling limit was demonstrated by Professor Stephen Chu, who is now a Nobel Prize winner and a former US Secretary of Energy. In 1985, him and his team cooled a cloud of sodium atoms to 240 millikelvin using Doppler cooling. This was a very significant step for the field as a whole, but there are other mechanisms that can make atoms even colder beyond the Doppler cooling limit, which brings us to what's known as the Sisyphus effect, first described by Jean Dalibard 
and Claude Cohen Tanuji in 1989. But to understand this, first we need to understand the Zeeman effect. Let's consider the atomic energy levels where n equals 1. Normally there are three energy levels, S1 half, P1 half and P3 halves. The states with total angular momentum 1 half have a degeneracy of 2, while the state with total angular momentum 3 halves has a degeneracy of 4. Now we apply an external magnetic field, which has the effect of lifting the degeneracy between the different values of the mj quantum number. The shift in energy of state fields due to the external magnetic field is known as the Zeeman shift, and the magnitude of the shift is dependent on the strength of the field. This effect can be viewed experimentally by the increase in the number of spectral lines that occur. This is due to the fact that there are now many more possible electronic transitions. Okay, now let's go back to talking about the Sisyphus effect. To set up the problem, let's consider atoms with a ground state with total angular momentum 1 half, g 1 half, and an excited state with total angular momentum 3 halves, e 3 halves. We also have laser light with the right frequency to excite the atoms between these two states. Let's say a beam of atoms is traveling to the right. There are also two laser beams with orthogonal polarization propagating in opposite directions along the atom beam axis. From the interaction between the atoms and the magnetic field of the laser beam, the ground state is split in such a way that the two states g plus one half and g minus one half oscillate through space, switching between which one of the states is higher in energy. If an atom starts from the bottom energy level, it will have to climb a potential hill, converting some kinetic energy into potential energy. The atom can now get excited by absorbing a photon. The importance of this next step is that the atom is most likely to emit a photon and transition to the lowest energy state. From this point, the atom has to climb yet another potential hill. Side note, the name Sisyphus comes from the story in Greek mythology where this man, Sisyphus, is forced to push a boulder up a mountain only to watch it roll back down again and rinse repeat for all eternity. So in relation to the Sisyphus effect, the boulder would be the atoms and the hill would be the laser light. Anyways, back to the video. Since the atoms spend more time going up potential hills than down, kinetic energy is gradually being converted to potential energy and radiated away by photons. The atoms will therefore slow down and cool the system. This introduces another cooling limit, known as the recoil limit, which is caused by the recoil an atom feels when emitting a photon. There are even more mechanisms that can cool atoms beyond the recoil limit, known as sub-recoil cooling mechanisms. These methods are beyond the scope of this video, but know that they do exist. But what do the cooling methods we've discussed so far look like in practice? Enter the optical magneto trap, the most commonly used apparatus to bring atomic gases down to the sub-Kelvin temperature range. The idea is relatively simple. First, we generate a spatially varying magnetic field using two conductive coils with oppositely running currents, referred to as an anti-Helmholtz configuration that you can see on the screen now. On top of this, we generate a region of what's called optical molasses, using six circularly polarized counter-propagating laser beams arranged orthogonally. The presence of a spatially varying magnetic field greatly facilitates optical cooling. This is due to the effects of the earlier discussed Zeeman shift. In our magnetic field setup, the shifts in our atomic energy levels vary with position. In the center of the apparatus, there is a zero field region with no appreciable magnetic field. In this region, the excited angular momentum states experience no change in sublevel energies. As you move away from the center, the magnetic field strength increases and the Zeeman shift increases too in a linear fashion. The effect of this changing shift is that as an atom moves away from the center of the trap, the gap in energy between its ground state and one of its excited states decreases. The optical molasses beams are red detuned in much the same way as when accounting for Doppler shift, meaning that the more the excitation energy gap is reduced, by the Zeeman shift, the closer the incident photons are in energy to that gap, making absorption of Z photons drastically more probable. This absorption causes kickback and emission momentum change as discussed earlier, with a resultant momentum change in the direction of the laser beam, i.e. back towards the center of the trap. Thus, this induced fluorescent cycle process acts as a restoring force, pushing all atoms back towards the center of the trap and pushing harder when the atoms drift further away.
The limitations of only using the optical magneto trap become apparent as the temperature of the gas approaches the Doppler cooling limit. As a result of the restorative force process outlined earlier, the cold, slow atoms congregate in the central zero field region of the trap, often called the dark zone, as because there is no Zeeman shift occurring in this area, very little absorption and emission of photons occurs so there is none of the pretty fluorescence. At this point, laser cooling reaches its effective limit. As such, at this point the lasers are often turned off and sub-recoil cooling methods are employed. During sub-recoil cooling, the trap continues to function without the application of optical molasses due to the trapping effect of the magnetic field. Even most neutral atoms have magnetic moments. In the presence of an external magnetic field, these magnetic moments will either align with or oppose the direction of the applied field. Atoms with magnetic moments opposed to the external field will seek to minimize their energies by moving to the area with the lowest field strength, the center of the trap. So again, we have a restorative force back towards the center of the trap, only this time it is considerably weaker, so is only viable for slow moving atoms, so is only used once the atomic gas is extremely cool and is most often the trapping method used during the final stage of cooling to form the Bose-Einstein condensate. The Bose-Einstein condensate is a state of matter reached by bosonic gases when cooled to temperatures approaching absolute zero. In this state, quantum scale phenomena such as wave function interference or quantum tunneling can be observed macroscopically with the same behaviour taking place in the substance overall. This effect is caused by such a high proportion of the bosons sitting in the same lowest energy quantum state and finds applications in lithography, optical lattice modelling and hyperprecise motion measurement. This video is an adaptation of material from chapter 15 of Physics of Atoms and Molecules by Branston and Joachim. On screen are other resources you may wish to consult if you want to learn more about this topic.